We lost a number of potters of huge standing in the ceramics community over the last year. One of them was Richard Batterham, a potter who was widely loved, revered and respected for his work. His pots earned him the esteem of some very prominent collectors and they're currently being celebrated in a major ongoing retrospective at the V&A Museum in London. Welcome back to the Goldmark Gallery and to our own celebration of the work of Richard Batterham. A couple of notes about the show itself. We've got a fantastic catalogue with an essay from Mike Dodd, so do pick up a copy. The exhibition pots themselves will be on sale only in person from this Saturday uh, at 10 a.m. and then on Sunday again at 11 a.m. Any pots that are left then will go online on Monday at 5 p.m. So do get to the gallery if you'd like to see this show and take something back with you. Um, pots online that may be left from this show Monday at 5 p.m. Every pot will also be issued with a special certificate signed by Mike Dodd certifying that it's come from his collection. There are over a hundred pots by Richard Batram in this pop-up show of ours at the gallery. Uh, they come from the collection of a fellow potter, Mike Dodd, who bought them over a great many years and he bought them to inform and educate his own work, his own practice as a potter. Pots like this extraordinary large bread bin here one that Mike actually almost had to persuade Richard Batterham to part with at the time. They sat in Mike's home as silent teachers, and he's now got to the point where he's decided that he wants to hand them on to the next generation in the hope that they will continue to speak to collectors and fellow potters for years to come. Richard Batterham is a fascinating potter because although much of the work we'll see in this exhibition feels very similar to people who know of the pots that we sell at the gallery. It has that very familiar Anglo-Oriental feel, that leech-style school of working. Richard really worked in isolation for his entire career. He was based from the same workshop, and the work that he produced was really a decades-long refinement of the same forms, the same range of work. He was not a regular exhibiting potter, and the forms that he made changed almost imperceptibly slowly over a great many years. Nor was he really an experimental potter. He was not the kind of man that you would see uh, filling about with new glazes. He did not build many different kilns. He was not trialling a vast range of new forms and new sculptural ideas. A jug like this example here was the basic essential form that he used for his jug making for virtually his entire career. The kind of words that come to mind people who describe Richard's work, describe his, uh, his legacy, are integrity and humility. He called it a certain quietness of life. It was a way of living, of working within his workshop space that simply allowed the work to happen day after day and to find in that continuous process some of the warmth and the life that we see in his pots. Batram had an extremely keen sense of design, a, a feeling for the forms that became part of his range, things like the teapots that we see down here, some of the bowls, the beaded lidded jars. He was incredibly concerned with the nuances of these forms, with refining them over a very uh, great number of years. And he got such a strong feeling for them that uh, he could take quite small forms, like little tea caddies, and enlarge them to sizes like this jar here, or even this monumental example across from me here. To be able to take some of these forms and expand them to a vast range of sizes, it's something that sounds very simple to lay folk like you and me, but to fellow potters out there will know that it's an extraordinarily demanding task. It actually requires you to, to know the complexities of what looks like a fairly simple form and how that's going to change as you expand it, as the walls become thicker, as you've got more clay on the wheel. It was this exacting attention to design that's perhaps the greatest aspect of his work. It was one that allowed him to dance that line between the purposefulness, the functionality, the servitude of craft, 
and the majesty of art, or the truth to materials of sculpture. It is in a way serendipitous that these pots came from Mike Dodd's collection, because both Mike and Richard Batterham had a very similar start to their introduction to clay. It was at the age of 13 that Richard Batterham was really made aware of what pottery could be and, and the, the liveliness of clay at Bryanston School, where both he and Mike Dodd were students. It was under the tutelage of the aptly named Donald Potter that he was first introduced to the work of people like Bernard Leach and Shoji Hamada, pots that sat around the student workshop, much as these did in Mike's own studio space as silent teachers. You'll see on a number of these pots here that we've got that lovely combination of the glazes that Richard liked to use and the raw clay itself. That's a refrain in many of his pots. You're always being made aware of the beautiful clay bodies that he mixed, which are underlying these stoneware works. At Bryanston School, Richard Batterham realized that he didn't just love clay, he actually had an eye and a hand for it too. And so after his two years in national service, he went and uh, served an apprenticeship at the Leach Pottery in St. Ives. It was here that he'd meet his, his wife, a fellow potter, but it was also here that he uh, came into contact with Atsuya Hamada, who was Shoji Hamada's son. He made a great impact, the kind of fluidity, the freedom of his work, but also the way that he worked, and the uh, Japanese-style kick wheel, which Richard was to use for the rest of his career, was modelled on Atsuya's. Then, in 1959, he struck out on his own, set up a studio space in Dorset. And he'd stay there, really, for the next six decades of his life, slowly expanding his workshop space and honing the range of wares that became so synonymous with his hand, with his eye, with his name, that they had no need for a potter's mark. Over those six decades, one of the things that he found was often said to him was, why don't you make the same thing over and over again? And he would always reply, well, to stop doing that would seem strange to him, because that would suggest that the last thing he made, there was no room for improvement, there was nowhere to go with it. And while the changes in his forms and his approach to what he was doing may seem imperceptible to us, it was a slow evolution that slowly incorporated new forms, uh, new design aspects, the introduction of a ridge to help lift a lid, for example, uh, the different faceting, cutting, uh, chattering marks that you'll see on all of the work in this exhibition, which really made the most of the ash glazes that were the basis for his work. Another phrase he would often use is selecting from what's on offer, of not over-engineering what he was doing. So while many of the forms that we see in this exhibition were sort of engineered with that kind of precision, they were uh, marked out lines, uh, very uh, much honed forms. Slips, the ochres, the wood ash glazes that are covering them were very much the sort of the standard available glazes that were carefully tinkered with until they had a really beautiful uh, quality of their own. Something that I particularly like is that amongst these wood ashes, the Cornish felspar, there's this beautiful use of cobalt. It gives this sort of uh, dreamy, almost like a Prussian blue colour that sits against the warmth of these olivey greens in the wood ash. It's something that you'll see time and time again in the pots in this, in this show. And placed around the rims of, of dishes like this, or around the top neck of a jar and allowed to, to drip through into the ash glaze, it's a really beautiful, glassy, jewel-like effect. Very little of what Richard made was overly decorative, and much of the decoration actually happened in the body of the pot itself. It's in the faceting, the cutting, the ribbing, the fluting, uh, the chattered marks that are a particular signature of his that you'll see on this beautiful dish down here. That's an effect that's created on the wheel with a, a, a thin strip of, of metal, ticks away with the, uh, against the metal, the metal sort of jabs in and cuts out very small bits of, of clay from the, the surface of the pot. It's this range of decorative marks that Richard knew would make the most of his glazes. Uh, they knew that he could accentuate the form, he could accentuate the, the movement around a pot, say a, a teapot with these curving cuts here, or the chattered rim of a dish. He knew that 
having these depressions within the surface would allow some of the, uh, the cobalt or the, uh, the wood ash glaze that he's got on some of these pots to pool. It would allow a sort of Tomoku style black glaze to break along edges. It's a very subtle, very uh, well established way of decorating pots, but it's one that gives everything this beautiful sense of, of composure, of consideration. You'll have noticed that uh, the pots in this exhibition are almost all of a domestic scale. They're pots that were to be used, that were sold on the basis that they would become part of people's lives from Rich's workshop. This was an important thing to him. As far as he was concerned, arguments about craft and art were pointless, really. He had a particular vein of work that he wanted to make, a tradition of, of long-standing, of anonymous craftsmen making beautiful things for people to use in their homes. And that's what you see reflected in the work here and in the current exhibition at the V&A. That's not to say that this work was uh, without artistic or creative consideration or, or aspiration. What I particularly like about Richard's work and something that a lot of people have picked up on is his ability to straddle the, those two worlds of the sort of what we see a lot of in contemporary pottery now, the kind of minimalism, the uh, very, very uh, highly designed, very careful lines of, of uh, often quite sparsely or undecorated pots with that old school world of the brown pottery brigade that was often spoken about in the 1960s and 1970s. Really, that comes down to, a, a, as I've mentioned several times going around this exhibition, a refinement, a honing, spending time within the same vernacular for a very long period of time so that it becomes not just innate, but um, completely uh, uh, consumed, completely understood, completely explored, finding new ways to ask questions within that limited range of, of uh, glazes, of shapes, of forms, of consideration. As a result, it's often in the small details that we really see Richard's work really shining. There's a particular example, if you come back here with me. I mentioned those facets, those cuts, the chattering, allowing the, the glaze to, to pool in these areas. I particularly love it on some of these lidded jars where the cut marks create almost a sort of star-like, sun-like motif on the lid. It's something very small, very carefully considered, something that you see a lot of on his pots. But just this simple act, this simple cutting into the surface here to create this motif, gives you a whole world of contrast with this glaze. It's allowing the pot to, to make its own artistic statement in a wheel, if, if you will, allowing the glaze and the clay to show off this beautiful variety. And just a simple act like that becomes part of a signature of what he does. It's a similar example of that kind of consideration on this vase here. It's got this beautiful, rich, almost honey, treacle-like manganese glaze. The thing I particularly like about this form, which you see recurring at different scales in this exhibition, is how thin Richard brings it in to this neck compared to this wide lip up here. It's again something very, very small, very carefully considered, but it gives a very simple, very spare pot, wonderful dramatic feel, wonderful swoop in this line. Richard Batterham was an intensely self-critical potter. And he would often make the point at retrospective exhibitions, at shows, of including work that had been underfired, of including uh, very early examples of work that he made, clumsy pots. And he did so not just to show that chance and freedom and creativity were as much a part of his making process as was the very strict discipline which ran his studio, which, uh, which dictated the shape, the range of his forms. He did so also to signal to the next generation that success, that proficiency, technical proficiency, but also a sense of spirit, a song in your pots could be achieved uh, despite the difficult start that is a life in pottery. 
that is the legacy that he leaves behind, as well as these beautiful pots. And it's also the challenge that he left to that next generation of young makers. I hope you've enjoyed seeing this beautiful collection of work. Uh, it's a, a small gathering of what was an extraordinary output from a single man. But it really gives an idea of what it is that Richard Batterham leaves behind him. I hope you've enjoyed and we'll see you again soon at the Goldmark Gallery.